Welcome back to another segment here on GEMS Podcast. With me today is Dave Hollenbach. For those of you that are new to the platform, my name is Miss Genesis Amaris Kemp. I am the founder and host. And for those seasoned listeners, thank you so much for coming back into the community. Here's a little bit about Dave. Dave Hollenbach is a retired fire department battalion chief, the author of Fireproof, your grand strategy for transforming failure into fuel for your future. A motivational speaker, coach, and mentor, he owns and operates David Hollenbach Consulting, LLC, and hosts the popular podcast, From Embers to Excellent. And today we're going to be focusing on leadership, overcoming adversity, and we're also going to hear more about how Dave overcame PTSD. For those of you that aren't familiar with that acronym, that is Post-Stress Traumatic Disorder. So without further ado, please welcome Dave Hollenbach to GEMS Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. My pleasure, Dave. And I am so grateful that you're coming into the community to share your story with the audience today. One thing that I like to do before we dive into the main part of the segment is a connection part where it allows you to be able to connect with the audience in a fun and personal manner outside of the heavy topics that we're going to discuss. So here are your options for connection segment. We could either do an icebreaker or a rapid fire 10 question game. And let's try to keep it rapid. I wish I had a clock to count down. So which option would you like to choose? Uh, I'm, I'm good with either or. What do you think is the most beneficial? I don't know. Let's do rapid fire because I'm sure there's a lot of things we're probably not gonna cover in the main part of the segment that the audience may wanna know about you. So here we go. Right. We're playing rapid fire with Dave and Genesis. Do, 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 do. Question one, what made you become a firefighter and then work your way up to battal- battalion chief? I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, um, I was uh, raised in the fire department. My dad was a, a fire department guy. He uh, was a firefighter. I remember him being a firefighter when I was in elementary school and him coming to the fire or coming to the school in the fire truck and, you know, letting us climb all over the fire truck. And, um, you know, the, the, the first fire station I ever went to, I ended up working at that station here and there. Uh, it was right around the corner from the house I grew up in and, you know, it, uh, it just seemed like a natural progression. After high school, I, I did a little bit of college and then joined the Navy. And when I got out of the Navy, went back to school and it was just like something just kept on pulling me in that direction. And I, you know, I, I don't talk about this much, but uh, I, I resisted it. I didn't want to follow in my dad's footsteps. And, uh, and I did, it ended up going to the same fire department that he retired from, and uh, and that's that's the department that I retired from. Amazing question two. I see you have a guitar in your background. Are you a beginner player or are you a novice or expert or what? How would you de- describe your guitar playing skills? Uh, so I, as far as time that has elapsed since I started playing. Uh, you know, you would think that I'd be a lot better than I am because <laughs> I, I started, um, well, let's see, three days before 9-11, I fell off of a three-story apartment building and broke my back. And oh my gosh. when I was able to sit up in a chair for uh, longer than five minutes, I decided, you know, I got to do something with this downtime. And I bought a guitar, that guitar. Uh, and, and I mess around with it here and there. It's a, it's a good stress relief kind of thing. And I, I can jam out a little bit, but I, I am far from being somebody that you would pay to listen to. I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay. So audience, 
I guess my, my question didn't go as planned because I was going to have him play something for you, but we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it moving. Question <laughs> three, <laughs> favorite color. Uh, fire engine red. Question four, who would you have lunch with past or present if you had the opportunity? Mm. <laughs> he stepped uh, y'all. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think uh, like what what comes to my mind like immediately, uh, Mar Marcus Aurelius, you know the the philosopher king. Um, Question. Yeah. Okay. Question five: If you could trade places with anyone in the world, would you trade places or remain yourself? No, I, I would stay myself. Question six, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Huh. If I had any superpower. <laughs> Man, I, I, I guess uh, the power to heal. Question seven, what's your favorite movie or book? <laughs> right. I would say right now, uh, so I read a lot, and the the book that I, I'm like just blown away. I, I've gone through it. Uh, I'm on my third pass through this particular book. It's just really, really good. It's called uh, The Warrior's Creed. Um, and. I, and who's yeah. the author of it, Dave? The Warrior's Creed? Yeah, um, let me. Uh, his name is Roger Sparks. I, I've got a copy of it back there. But um, yeah, he is uh, in the book. He, he actually takes you through his life uh, leading up to, to joining the Marine Corps, uh, going into Marine, uh, the Special Forces, um, Force Recon becoming an instructor, uh, teaching other force uh, recon Marines, then getting out of the Marine Corps and joining the Air Force to become a uh, pararescue man, which those are the guys, that's the Air Force's Special Forces guys. And they get uh, dropped in to like real bad combat zones to extricate soldiers and marines that have been wounded in action and uh they're they're like high speed paramedics oh wow um, that have uh some really amazing skills at not only uh saving lives but you know they're, they're experts with weapons as well so he became a pararescue man and ended up uh earning or being awarded the Silver Star for Valor uh, in Operation Bulldog Bite over in Afghanistan. And um, just an incredible person. I actually interviewed him on my podcast and uh, the book is just, it, it's, it's one that for me and my background, there was, uh, there was parts of the book that, I mean, just really spoke to me. There was parts that made me cry. It, it was, uh, you know, parts that just made me go, holy crap, like this is an, an amazing dude. And then I've met him in person uh, and he's like six foot nine and just like this, huge guy but like real real fit and and slim um just but he's a legend really, really cool guy that's amazing and i'm glad that the book had an impact on you and you were able to actually meet him in person question eight early on in your background you mentioned that you went to the navy why did you choose the navy out of the other military branches well in in high school 
I, well, it was actually before that. I had aspired to go to the Naval Academy. And, you know, I grew up around the time when Top Gun came out in the theaters, you know, and I, I wanted to be just like Maverick. Um, and and so I, I thought, well, you know, I'll go to the Naval Academy. And I got involved in a lot of extracurricular activities that were, you know, supposed to help me get into the Naval Academy. And then um, I got into sports and discovered girls and my grades did not uh, reflect that desire to go to the Naval Academy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I was in a thing called the Sea Cadets, which is kind of like ROTC, but it's directly affiliated with the Navy and it's not associated with any schools, whereas ROTC units, they're attached to a particular school. And in high school, I was in Marine Corps ROTC, um, which the Marine Corps falls under the Department of the Navy. Um, and it was just, uh, when, when I was in 11th grade, uh, yeah, I, I, I ended up breaking my leg really bad and I couldn't, the Navy wouldn't allow me to, actually none of the uh, branches would allow me to enlist because of the hardware that was in my leg. And so I went to school after high school and ended up injuring myself. And I, I ended up having the hardware removed, which allowed me to then enlist and uh, the Navy was, it just seemed like a natural choice. My dad was a Navy veteran. Um, and so I, I, I went to boot camp and uh, ended up breaking my leg again. Oh, wow. When I was in the Navy and ended up getting discharged uh, medically, um, which when I, when I ended up getting home after uh, 14 months in the Navy, um, you know, you, you get that, that lost feeling. I was, I was still kind of young, not knowing what to do. I was real bitter about getting kicked out of the Navy uh, because I was, I was good. I was fit. I was running like five miles a day and they didn't take that into consideration. They just said, well, you re-injured that same leg. So you're out. <clears throat> so, so wait don't dive in any any further because i'm sure you're gonna have some of these um nuggets for the main segment and the book so i want to save some stuff for the audience so question nine here this is an easy one what is your drink of choice coffee tea or something else uh, coffee and question 10 it's our last question and here are the rules if you pass our roles are reversed and you get to ask me a question if you choose to play, I ask one last question to wrap up rapid fire. And audience, we spent a little longer time on rapid fire today because there was a lot of meat that needed to be shared. So what's your choice, Dave? Are you going to pass or do you want to play? And what are we playing? Okay, so if we play, I ask one last question for rapid fire. If you pass, this is where our roles are reversed and you get to ask me one question. Huh. He's thinking, y'all. He's trying to make a good decision here. Well, I, I wasn't prepared to ask you any questions, and I would normally. Yeah, let's let let's uh, let's pass. Let me let me ask you a question. Okay, sure. What's your question? What inspired you to start this podcast? Oh, this is a good one. A lot of people have been asking me. So actually, my podcast was born out of grief. I lost my dad November 25th, 2020 to medical negligence after he went to the hospital in May. Three days later, they paralyzed my dad from the waist down. And then his health just... Um, began to go up and down. And then the day before Thanksgiving, 
we found out that they found my dad unresponsive in his hospital room, which was right across from the nurse's station. And, you know, it crushed me because my dad and I were super, super close. Like he's always been my right hand, my right hand man outside of my husband. And, you know, when I lost him, I really took a spiral down. So, but hindsight 2020, um, you know, I'm grateful that I'm able to have the show because not only did I start doing solo episodes, but then it also allowed me to go through the grief process in the middle of a pandemic when a lot of people lost um, loved ones, friends, even job losses, because within a year and a half, I had four, four L's is what I call it. So four losses. My dad got laid off from oil and gas after being in the industry for 12 years, one week after my father passed, then my grandmother passed nine months and five days later. Then when I came home from visiting my family in the Caribbean, my other grandmother passed. So it was like losses after losses. So um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I started my show. And I'm just grateful to see where the show has transitioned and transformed based on something as hard as grief. Man, thank you for sharing that. And I'm, I'm so sorry for your losses. Thank you. And thank you for doing the connection round. Um, audience, I hope you learned a little bit more about who Dave is because we're gonna spend time transitioning into leadership and how he helps people overcome adversity. And then we're gonna hit a bit on PTSD because no matter if you served in combat, no matter if you had a traumatic injury in your life or maybe ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, those can all cause PTSD. And sometimes people think, oh, you have to be a soldier to get PTSD, but no, even mother Others could get PTSD along with postpartum depression. And me getting ready to walk into my motherhood journey, we I start talking more and more about other mothers. So I'm interested to hear Dave talk about it from a male perspective. And we're also going to be respectful of Dave's time too. So Dave, let's just jump right into the main segment. So early on, you mentioned that you didn't want to be like your dad, but I learned more and more just based on your bio and the connection round that you did end up following in your father's footsteps. He was a Navy veteran. You ended up going to the Navy. He was a firefighter. You ended up going to the firefighter. So my question for you as we get ready to dive in is why did you not want to follow your father's footsteps? Well, my <clears throat> my mom and dad got divorced when I was five years old and I moved in with my dad and my stepmother when I was 12 years old and not long after that I uh, <clears throat> I ended up Well, it was, it was, uh, gosh, I was in high school when I broke my leg and it was during that time that my dad got called up to active duty for, uh, the Gulf, uh, the Gulf war. And he went away and I was, um, yeah, it was my stepmom and me, and she was working two jobs. Um, she was working two jobs and I, I couldn't, uh, you know, I guess it was just me being a, a young man that, or a, a teenager that didn't quite see beyond my own little world. And I was, uh, frustrated with how things went between my dad and me. And, uh, and I felt like my younger brother was the favorite. Um, I, I was the oldest and, uh, I, you know, I was just trying to find a way to fit in and, and feel like I was valued. And, um, when I didn't feel like, uh, you know, I was valued by him, I resisted following in his footsteps. 
but ultimately, you know, like I wanted him to be proud of me. So I, I ended up following in his footsteps and, and trying to do better than he did. So question here, based on your relationship with your father and you feeling the way that you felt, and it's commendable for you to talk about your feelings because depending on how you're raised, some men are told not to express their feelings because it's a sign of weakness. Now that you're an adult and you, you're older and mature, did you ever tell your dad how you felt and why you resisted? Because from you being the oldest, the oldest child, you having a little brother and you feeling maybe you felt like you were an outcast or some people would say the black sheep of the family or however you want to say it you felt like, okay, I just want to be loved. I want to be accepted. I want to be approved by my father until so you were vying, vying, vying for his attention, but maybe he didn't necessarily know how to love or nurture you. Would you say that's a good um, example there? Yeah. And, and I didn't, you know, I, I haven't actually told him um, how how I felt back then, uh, you know, my dad is very stoic. I have attempted to have some serious conversations and, uh, you know, it's typically when he starts to, I can tell he'll start feeling a little emotional and he'll say, you know, we need to revisit this some other time and the conversation ends. So, you know, it's, it's good that you're uh, asking me these questions because I tend to push them into the back of my mind. That's some residual effects, you know, of uh, I, I've done a lot of work to actually be able to express my emotions. Um, I spent 23 years in the fire service and most of them, I just shoved down all of those emotions of, um, uh, horrific calls that I went on and um, didn't ask for help when I was struggling with nightmares or, it, you know, it, it took a long time for me. Uh, actually, it took for me to like almost lose everything for me to go, you know what, I probably ought to go get some help. And uh, that's, that's really when I started to work at, at being able to express myself. And I'm glad we're talking about this. And I know if, if a question cut does come up that you don't wanna answer, just say, Genesis, let's table this conversation for offline. And I guess the reason why I'm asking these questions is because I'm a visionary life coach. And I really believe that whenever we don't discuss certain things, we're not going to really heal properly. And I know that from personal experience, from being a victim of bullying in high school, going through depression, having four L's that I mentioned briefly early on and et cetera. And every loss that I have and every trial that I went through, you know, it made me stronger later on and later on. And it helped me build my character, even though it wasn't conducive while I was going through the midst of it. Even, you know, um, getting ready to transition from dating to engagement to now married to my husband, like, it, it was rough and we had some ups and downs, but I tell people you have to realize what's, what's important. And that brings me to how you help overcome advers adversity because you had to almost go low in order to get yourself to go inward, to really ask yourself those hard questions, to really face um, face the man or like MJ says, and MJ is Michael Jackson, y'all. I'm looking for the man in the mirror. And I'm not going to sing, y'all. I'm not a singer. I just like to have fun on my show. And for you women that are listening, sometimes you have to look yourself in the mirror and it can be hard because whenever you look at that reflection back, you don't like what you see, but what are you going to do about it? Because you have all the power and control to make a change. And going out and seeking help, whether it's a life coach, a therapist, or just being real with yourself and letting yourself know, I'm not okay, but I'm going to work on becoming okay, because if not, life is going to take me back, and I need to take control of my life in order to catapult me to the next level. So you wrote the book, Fireproof. 
at what stage did you decide that you wanted to write the book Fireproof after you were already going through your personal development and growth of overcoming adversity? Well, the book started off as a, a leadership book. I, I started it uh, shortly after my younger brother passed away um, in, in 2010. He, he died suddenly. Um, it wasn't expected. He wasn't ill. He, he struggled with substance abuse. And, um, and it, was, it was horrible. He left behind uh, a son that was just shy of two years old. And I had a daughter. I mean, I have a daughter. And at the time, my daughter was three years old. Um, or I'm sorry, she was four years old. Is that right? No. It, when my brother passed away, my daughter was three years old, just shy of her fourth birthday. So um, I, I wanted to do something that, uh, you know, I could be proud of, but would really be something that I could show my nephew and my daughter, like, hey, look, you know, this is the stock that you come from. If you apply yourself, you can accomplish some amazing things. And then to my nephew say, you know, look at these things that I've accomplished. Your father was so much better than me. People liked him so much more than they like me. So, <laughs> And like, this is the stock that you come from. Like you can accomplish so much, just apply yourself. And, um, and I, through those years from 2010 to 2019, there was a lot of ups and downs, um, other losses, you know, my mom passed away, my, my grandfather passed away, like one year to the day of my mom's funeral. And, um, it's just really um, pretty crazy, like the the events that led to fireproof were just those those moments when you feel like you're in this abyss and you will never be able to climb out of it. Yes. Um, the the grief, the the feelings of hopelessness that when you're in those those moments or those those chapters in your life or you know phase whatever you want to call it when you're at that time in your life when you're just really struggling it's hard to see how anything could get any better but the reality is, is that if you can just push through, endure that pain, things do get better. And they prepare you, those, those tough times prepare you to be able to help other people when they're struggling. Absolutely. And I'm sorry for your losses as well. And, and who knew that we would have some parallels. So um, biologically, I didn't lose a sibling, but I lost my cousin in 2015. And we were three years apart. So we grew up as um, sisters in a sense. And everywhere Vanessa went, you saw me. So it was like me and Vanessa. And even though she was the younger one, people always thought that she was the older one. So I could resonate in a sense where you're coming from, from losing your younger brother. Then you lost your mother. And, you know, boys, some people say boys are mama's boys, or you have a good relationship with your mother. I don't know what your relationship is like with your mother, but me, losing a parent, I can relate to that because I've lost a parent, but I can't relate to how you felt because your relationship with your mother is totally different than my relationship with my father. But I do have empathy, the fact that we both lost parents. Then your grandfather, me losing 
two grandmothers and you losing a grandfather, that's another type of grief. And I tell people, everyone goes through grief differently and that's okay. And there's no right or wrong reason on how to grieve. But then I always also tell people, life is like a roller coaster. There's gonna be highs, there's gonna be lows, there's gonna be zigzags, roundabouts, upside downs. I, I love roller coaster. I love to do the crazy ones. Um, and whenever I think about that, I was like, this is just how life is. Like when you're high, everything is good. It's nice or whatnot. But whenever it takes that plunge and goes down really fast, it's like you have that pit in your stomach. It feels like your heart is popped out. Your, uh, your chest is beating fast, it's racing, and you feel like you can't catch your breath. So all you could do in the mi- in the minute, because sometimes it's a minute, y'all, or less than that, is you just scream and you have this big belly scream that helps you get over it. And before you know it, you're getting ready to go back up on that incline again and the roller coaster continues. And so I like how you talked about that. And I like how you said, that whenever you were talking to your nephew and your daughter, you were telling them, this is, this is your stock. And what I heard is when you were talking about stock, this is the legacy that your father built and left for you. This is the legacy that I am your dad and built and building and leaving for you. But then one thing that I did not resonate with was the fact that you said, your dad was better than me. One thing that I would encourage you to to start saying or a challenge for you, Dave, from a coaching perspective is realize that you and your brother were both different people, but y'all both had, y'all, he had amazing skills and talents and you have amazing skills and talents as an individual. And just because you felt like he was better, y'all just were good at different things. And that was maybe your perspective of viewing your brother when people may have viewed you differently, but maybe it was imposter syndrome that was causing you to reflect on how you viewed yourself when maybe on the outside, other people didn't view you that way. Cause sometimes we can be ourselves biggest critics. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah. And and the reason I was I, I put that in there is because at that time in my life, the moment, the day that I decided to write that, that leadership book, I I was struggling really, really bad with the loss of my brother. And uh, so that he passed away on February 4th. <clears throat> Uh, 2010. And I hadn't talked to him since Christmas of 2009. And on Christmas Day, he and I uh, got into a really big fight and said a lot of nasty things to one another. And when, when he passed away, we hadn't reconciled. And um, and so I had a lot of guilt, you know, I, I, I had a lot of guilt surrounding all of that. And um, it was just, it, it was things that I had not come to terms with. And when I decided to write that book um, to really show my nephew or, or to leave something for him to, to say, okay, you know, this is what I come from, you know, my brother, he always made better grades than me athletically. He, um, you know, he was much smaller than me and uh, just, you know, with wrestling and weightlifting, you know, they, they're in weight classes. So for his weight and his size, he achieved um, greater recognition than I did. Uh, but it's it those are things that I don't measure myself by and it was it was like this I don't know at that time it was like this jealousy kind of thing like you know you had all these gifts and you and you threw them away and you know and I don't want people to view him for that that last part of his life where he was struggling because he did so many things and he was just like everybody loved him he was such a sweet man and kind would do anything for anybody and he was hilarious um 
and 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 so that was that was something that I I didn't want people to to look at. I wanted them to see him for who he truly was. Amazing. Okay, so that definitely helps clarify that. And thank you for bringing it into context, Dave. And this is going to be the last question before we jump into to the CTA and wind down. So I want you to hold up that book that you wrote, because I want the, those watching the video to see the cover of the book. Okay, so I see fireproof and I see the fire. Let's talk about the intentionality behind the cover of the book. So hold it up as you talk about the book, just so the audience can see. So All right, let's see if I can get it. So it is uh, a compass. Um, oh, okay. It kind of looks like a fire from from a distance, but now I see the compass. I do see it. Yeah, and and the point of the compass, and of course the there is that fire aspect to it because. I come from the lens of, uh, you know, my, m the bulk of my professional adult life, I, I served in the, in the fire service. And a lot of what I talk about comes from that perspective. Um, and, you know, I, I talk about the importance of self-leadership, uh, self-awareness, you know, I walk people through uh, an exercise on really discovering who you are, what is important to you. Because when I left the fire service, and I talk about it in here, um, we, we don't have enough time to go into it. But when I left the, the fire department, it was not because I wanted to. Um, I left, uh, you know, and, and I was disgraced. And it was, uh, I went from being a very well-respected, high-achieving chief officer to, uh, you know, somebody slandering my, my name and, um, you know, it was, uh, it was tough. I mean, now granted, I, I made some poor decisions, but um, not to the degree that, um, you know, led to me leaving the fire department. So, so let me interject really quick, Dave. So quick question. So why did you choose to name, uh, name the book Fireproof? What so the idea is that when you, when you crash and burn, you know, you feel like all is lost. And when I crashed and burned and lost almost everything, I, I had this identity crisis where, you know, for 23 years, I identified as this firefighter, as a fire officer, as a, as a chief fire officer. Um, I had served as the chief of special operations. I had achieved all these amazing things in the fire service. And so that was my identity. And when I left the fire service, I felt like I lost who I was. And I really had to dig deep and discover who I truly was and what was important to me. And really what I stood for. And, uh, and when you do that, you fire, to me, you fireproof yourself against really. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm getting where you're going that. So this kind of relates to my background in a sense, because my background's oil and gas and I worked in a chemical plant for some time. So whenever you say you fireproof yourself, I just got the visual representation 
as if I'm wearing FRCs. So for those of you, FRCs are flame retardant clothing and I'm going out into the unit. I'm either working with the process engineers, the chemical engineers, and I need to go check on my chemicals that are out in the tanks or whatnot. But at, from a safety protocol, we have to put on FRCs. So in case something were to happen and something were to combust or catch fire, we don't get burns on our skin. So whenever you said fireproof, it made me think about uh, FRCs. Would you say that's a good example to bring the audience into? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a great example. Um, yeah, that that is an excellent analogy, and and what I was shooting for. Um, you know, when when I talk about failure in the book, it's it's semantics. You know, you can you can make mistakes, you can make poor decisions, we all do. And sometimes the repercussions are worse than others. You're human, you know, we're all human, we're going to make mistakes and bad things are going to happen that are out of our control. The only thing that we do have control over is how we respond. And in, in those times. Um, how we respond to the things that happen in our lives. Um, and, and when we realize that, when we focus on what we actually have control over, rather than things that are out of our control, we, we can fireproof ourselves Because it's when we act out of emotion and, you know, we can't always just say like, turn off the emotion, you know, but we can, we can try to put ourselves in the position where we can recognize, okay, this is out of my control because a lot of times that's what we do is we react to, to stuff, to emotional situations. Somebody hurts our feelings. Uh, somebody lies about us. Somebody does something mean or, you know, maybe we get ill and can't uh, earn the money that we need to earn for whatever, X, Y, Z. Those are all challenges. But if we focus on what we do have control over, we can make those situations better. Absolutely. And we're going to table that part of the conversation and we're going to jump into the CTA um, so what is your call to action for the audience today once they heard our chat regarding the, some of the things that you went through in your life as well as the book? And I'm sure for those of you listening who want to know more about Dave, feel free to go out and grab that book and then read the book. And if there are certain questions you have, maybe we could do a live Q&A with Dave at a later date. So Dave, for your CTA, I want you to plug your website and tell the audience where they could primarily connect with you on social media. And then if you have three quick and brief tips to help them overcome adversities, share that as well. So my website is hollenbachleadership.com, H-O-L-L-E-N-B as in boy, A-C-H, leadership. Dot com, And everything is on my website, all of my social media. I'm, I'm on just about every platform, except Pinterest. Um, <laughs> um, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and my, um, my podcast is on there. I have uh, the fireproof store, which is where you can buy my book, you can buy T-shirts, sweatshirts, challenge coins. Uh, I'm about to have uh, hats on there. Um, but the book is only available on my website right now because the official release is October 11th. That's when it'll be available in bookstores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all that. Um, so right now, if you order it on my website, I'll sign it. Uh, you can put in there who you want the book made out to. If, if not you, um, you know, I'll, uh, 
I'll sign it, put a nice little message in there for you and send it your way. Um, the, the call to action is just, you know, check out my website and there's a lot of resources on there related to PTSD, um, veterans and first responders, uh, are, are really the, the focus of the resources page on my website. Um, there's a lot of resources for veterans and first responders that are struggling with PTSD. But I also have uh, things on there related to the ACEs study, uh, different statistics. You know, people a lot of times feel like they're alone when they're struggling. And the reality is, is that we all have experienced some form of trauma in our, our lives. Um, more often than not, the people around you have struggled with very similar experiences, but nobody wants to talk about it um, because everybody feels like they're the only ones that can relate to how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe the experiences are different, but the emotions experienced are the same. The pain is the same. You know, maybe I can't relate to you and, and losing a father because I've lost my mother and my relationship with her was not all that great where your relationship with your father was. And, but the pain that you experience when you lose somebody that you care for is real and it can, and it can put you in a bad place. And, um, and I think that is where we need to, to focus when it comes to, to trauma and pain is how we relate to one another. And then be self-aware when we're struggling. We, we talked about it a little bit. Everyone has a tendency to be very uh, critical of themselves and I would urge you to give yourself some grace. I think that's, that's really the big call to action there is to give yourself some grace because when we focus on the things that we've done wrong, there's little room left to recognize all the things that we've done right and the good that we've done in this world. Absolutely. And thank you for that call to action, uh, Dave and audience. Once again, Dave's contact information will be in the show notes. It's one website link and the website will have the back link to his social media platforms. For those of you that are new to the platform again, and those seasoned listeners, make sure you like, comment, follow, and subscribe. We're on 40 plus platforms. If you want to see the video to this recording, head on over to the YouTube channel and just type in GEMS, G-E-M-S, with Genesis Amaris Kemp. And lastly, but not least, my big ask, A-S-K, is for brand sponsors. If that is you and you want to have your products, services, and your overall brand in this community where this podcast is currently ranked in the top 2% globally out of 2.8 million podcasts, per www.listennotes.com. Feel free to head on over to my website, which is genesisamarskemp.net or send me a personalized email to the name of the show, which is gems with Genesis Amaris Kemp at gmail.com to find out how you could sponsor this platform because the mission and the movement is to bring content that is educational, inspirational and motivational while also weaving in and intersecting the dots for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging because it does take all of us coming together to make this world a better place. So until the next guest, next segment, peace, love, and lots of blessings and give yourself grace and mercy. And I want to thank you for everything that you do for this community. And remember, your situation is is not permanent like you may think it is. It's temporary, but it's also building your character. And there, it's always going to get dark before it gets bright. 
Think about a thunderstorm. The clouds are always dark and it's always gloomy outside. But once that thunderstorm passes, you may see a rainbow without a pot of gold at the end and you may see the beautiful sunshine. So think about that whenever you're going through certain tests, trials, tribulations, or hardships in your life. They're building you up for the testimonies and the message that you'll, you will be sharing later on. Until then, peace y'all.